How's it going? My name is John Edward Heath, and I have a fighter's heart. What does it mean to me to have a fighter's heart? I think, I think my life has been full of adversity. So the definition for me is, I think we've, as a society, we've watered down everyone's life lessons and trials and tribulations. So I think it can vary from something as traumatic as an accident or losing a loved one to something as, you know, not having enough money to pay rent. So I think what it means to have a fighter's heart would be, how do you get up from whatever situation is thrown your way? And I think that that's what separates a person from achieving just living, man. Being a human is pretty hard, especially these days, financially, emotionally, you know, spiritually. But it's more about what you do to get out of that certain circumstance and move forward. I think I've had a fighter's heart since, you know, I came out of birth. I was in and out of the foster care system, but my story is pretty unique due to the fact that I lived with my biological families for many years. I was removed from the home several times. Um, at the age of 14, the state of Maryland uh, was pretty much fed up and they, you know, wanted to deem me uh, property of the state, which pretty much made me an adult. Fast forward, I, you know, joined the service at 17. I lived in a recruiting station for a couple of months just to go to boot camp. You know, joined the service, which was only supposed to be a one enlistment, ended up being 10 years. Due to milita military malpractice, I ended up having an amputation. I had 13 surgeries, 13 lower extremity salvation surgeries in the span of five years. So that was a huge roller coaster from 2016 until 2021, where I became a left below the knee amputee. 2018, I would lose my best friend who was a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps due to suicide. Then during COVID 2020, I would lose my partner to suicide. Dealt with all that. You know, I had out drinking problems. I was doing drugs. I wasn't using my full potential as a professional athlete. Fast forward, I do not drink, I do not do drugs. I, from the water that I ingest to the food that I put in my body is priority number one. Uh, I am with an elite track and field team as I am a T64 Paralympic sprinter, um, training for Paris 2024. I'm also one of the faces of adaptive CrossFit. Hopefully, you know, win some championships in that realm. And then fast forward after Paris 2024, I will transition to start training for 2026 in Paralympic snowboarding. I had an accident, uh, but the accident wasn't the reason what caused my amputation. So I was pretty healthy when I had the accident. It was the doctors that tried to fix my leg and it just one surgery turned to four, that turned to six, that turned to 10, that turned to 12. Um, I, I walked away from the military due, due to mental health issues. Um, and I just needed to, I was tired. I was done with the surgeries. I needed to find a professional, someone with more education. If my leg could be salvaged, it wasn't, I, I spent a year and a half with a device specifically for salvage limbs. I competed with it. ESPN reporter, Kenny Maine paid for it. You know, I, I moved forward during COVID because of him. Uh, NFL quarterback Alex Smith, he had a traumatic injury. We both related with the injuries. We both wor worked with hanger clinics. So he was a big factor into my progression as someone with a salvaged limb. And then I had to make the decision of getting an amputation. So I was fine. So I opted for an amputation in 2018. The military denied it. Medical is very political. You can't just go in there and say like, hey, chop my leg off. So in 2021, I, we, everybody was preparing for Olympic trials and whatever discipline you do. And I had to make the decision. They finally approved my amputation. So I had to make a decision of going to Olympic trials for Olympic weightlifting with a 60% leg, uh, leg or having an amputation. And I called my parents, I called my pastor, I called my best friend, Olympian Devin Allen. I called, you know, NFL quarterback, Alex Smith and finally made the decision 30 days later, I would be sitting in the hospital with a amputation. So I think the weirdest thing for me is I felt like my leg was backwards. So I felt like my foot was facing the opposite way. 
and that was the first day that I woke up. And then the second day, it was weird. I felt my toes, you know, how like if you cut an octopus's tentacles and like wiggles or like a snake, that's what I felt my toes were doing. Um, so that was extremely weird. I think the psychological effects wasn't the amputation itself, just because I had been dealing with this uh, disability for about six years. It was more of the fact that I was in a hospital during COVID. So they only allowed uh, my best friend's mom to come in every so often. And then Devin Allen, right before he left the trials, he was the one who took care of me for my amputation. Post amputation, I actually got out of the hospital earlier than anticipated. I think I was in the hospital for like two and a half days. And then they sent me home because I was fed up. But um, I think the easiest thing for me is what a lot of people need to understand is I had a, I had a lot of influential elite people around me. And what I mean by that is like, there's just a lot of Sonny Webster was my coach at the time, or, you know, he's still a very good friend of mine who's an Olympic weightlifter. So for me, it was like, let's get this done. And how do we get myself back into a platform? And I was trying to compete in Olympic weightlifting as an amputee. Olympic weightlifting is my passion. I've, I've Olympic weightlifted for almost 15 years. Weightlifting, I've weightlifted for 15 years. And it just was, how are we going to maximize my efforts, my energy, and my situation to, you know, overcome it. And I think coming out of the hospital with a mission was what progressed everything. I am plant-based, so I don't eat meat. You know, I don't eat animal products. I stopped drinking. I stopped doing drugs. So I actually was one of the fastest, like, healing amputations this hospital had ever seen. It had to do with a lot of the stuff. I think mental, mental you know, positive mental attitude played one of the biggest roles into healing. I was, dude, I was, I was in a elite like training camp, 60 days post amputation. So it was like one thing after the other, but I think the biggest thing for me now is like, I never really got to mourn my accident. So there's just a lot of trauma that I'm now unraveling. My two year ampuversary is actually next month when national championships are for track and field, which is a great achievement. However, it just gives you a timeline of like, I really haven't had a time to like sit back and just breathe. You know, my biggest stressor as an amputee is the fact that I have to, when you have to go to the bathroom at like one in the morning, I would forget I had a leg sometime or that I was missing a limb sometimes, right? So uh, I think the first, I, I was really proficient at crutches and I'm really proficient at a wheelchair because I was disabled for five years before I had an amputation. So passing the, the PT exam in the hospital, um, was fairly easy for me. I think the biggest thing for me was like the phantom pain. It was like you're like you felt your limb was still there, right? So, but it's not. So <laughs> walking around doing that, man, it was like super hard. But it was like, I think you just adapt. I mean, it was crazy because like my right side, like my quad got bigger, my calf got bigger. Mind you, I have weight lifted for 15 years trying to grow these calves. <laughs> and everything you did didn't work. And then all of a sudden you get an amputation and you're hopping around on one leg. Um, and, it, and it finally grew. But it was, I think the craziest thing was like my body, your body adapts, man. It was, it was super weird within the next couple of weeks of how like your body, body started to realize, okay, you're missing a limb. My biggest drive, honestly, isn't the medals. It's not the accolades. I, if, if you know me personally, I actually hate being in the media. I, I, I don't like it's really weird for me when people know who I am. It was funny because like one of the flight attendants from my last competition, like Googled me and it was just, it's just really uncomfortable. Um, but I think, so my biggest drive for me are two things. One is my biggest why. And then the second is it's more, it's more the dis disabled community. Uh, for me, my, like what pushes me to continue achieving is there's kids that, you know, there's a 14 year old girl that I mentor. Her name is Katie Ed Eddington. She has, she's a above the knee amputee. You know, there's a two, three-year-old Louie, you know, the kid's missing both his legs, his hands are fused, but it, I mean, the kid gives life into perspective. And I just, I, I think it's really cool when kids tell me like, I see someone on TV or in a magazine that looks like me. And my biggest drive was after my amputation, one of the biggest things that started my career and how passionate I became was six days post amputation i did a one-legged power clean just messing around seeing if i could still do it and it went viral on social media sunny webster 
posted it and then like blew up in the UK. Well, I got discriminated at the gym that I did it at and they called me a liability. It was, it was, dude, it was a very traumatic, like I had never felt disabled in six years. And here I am like fresh amputation. I posted a video on it and, you know, and, and it went viral. And then I got like hundreds of messages from the disabled community of like, you know, it, it's of their stories and how they've been discriminated. And, and it was just, it just went on from that. And it gave me a purpose of like, okay, you're very, you're loud, you're abrasive. You really don't care. Dude, I'm, I'm one of, I'm like one of, I think it's like 12 of us. There's like one of 12 gay pro athletes. I've dealt with adversity. I've dealt with hatred. I've dealt with discrimination, you know? So it was not anything abnormal to me to take backlash from people or, you know, fall on the sword. And I think that's what helped. When I say I'm one of the faces of adaptive CrossFit, it's not because I'm one of the best, you know, I, I'm new to the sport as an amputee, but I've advocated so much for the, the unfairness and the expansion of the sport. That's what it's for me. I work at POA. I work with an organization called 50 Legs. All these kids and new amputees, man, they, when they see what I'm doing or how I force them to try something new or force them out of their comfort zone, you have a guy who's pushed, I've pushed my limits for two years. We're talking fresh amputation. I've tried every prosthetic out in the, in the book. You know, I've gone snowboarding, I've gone, I've gone surfing, I still Olympic weightlift, I've done CrossFit, I've done gymnastics, I, you know, do elite track and field. So there's no real, like, you can't do this. Like, I, and I don't fall victim. Like, I don't want people being like, you're an inspiration. Like, dude, I'm just breathing, you know? And I think that in the disabled community, we have a habit of like, there's a lot of people that became like social media famous from the like, oh man, you're so inspirational. It's like, dude, you've, some of you guys have had your whole life to figure out how to live without a limb. You know, it's, it's, I get it. It's inspirational. But at the end of the day, like, what did you do with that time? you got platforms with being an amputee. Like, what did you do for the community? What did you do for these kids? And that's been my biggest drive. Oof, my why is my partner committed suicide in 2020. He left a, a daughter. Un ironically, she started doing track and field without me knowing. So that lets you know that kids are watching. She plays second in her class, in her division in California. And then my best friend who, man, we were close, closer than anything. And I think a part of me died when he committed suicide, but he left a mom and a grandmother. And that's, I want to take care of them, you know, to some extent. So I, you got to be successful. Money, money talks, money moves the world. But I think my biggest why as well is I, I battle with depression and anxiety and PTSD every day. I'm not artificial about it. I don't just say like, we need to raise money for, you know, the LGBT youth, or we need to raise money for suicide prevention. Like I live mental health every day. I wake up sad. There's days that I wake up depressed. I could be the number one on a podium at a competition, but I'm not fully fulfilled, right? It's more about how I, show up every day it's not about what i'm doing in five years it's not about will i be the best adaptive paralympic athlete in the world will i be the best advocate it's more about like showing people truly what you can do no matter what your mental health is i think the biggest advice is uh live your true authentic self man we as kids we care about what people say that moves on to being an adult I've witnessed people forget someone after they die. You know, once Brad died and once my partner died, it was like the life went on. So why are we so stuck in being ugly to each other? Why are we stuck in hating on each other? Life is hard as it is, man. So be kind and surround yourself around people that are going to push you. I, I don't have time for negative, toxic people, you know, that just drags you down. I'm, I surround myself around individuals who want to be successful in their career fields or want to be the best mom they can be or the best dad they can be. That plays a very vital role to me showing up every day. I am competing this weekend. There's a lot of meets here in Florida. Um, we have national championships in three weeks in Chula Vista Olympic Training Center, California. Um, honestly, I am just trying to perfect my craft. We have the Olympic year next year. You know, I'm going to make that Paralympic team to go to Paris. 
So I would honestly say like I'm running meets right now to get them under my belt, but it's more of getting as much training and working with as many people that can help me really, really perfect my craft as a Paralympic sprinter.